in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We enter today, my brothers, the second week of our retreat. And this week is titled Christ the King and His Call. I prefer, however, to title it in this manner, Jesus, the King and His Call. And the reason why I prefer Jesus, because Christ is more often than not understood as the exalted title for Jesus, we talk about the risen Christ. So that is why I want to focus on Jesus. And when I use the term Jesus, I mean the human Jesus. The Jesus who lived and walked and taught and ate and drank in first century Palestine. This is the Jesus we must encounter in the second week. There is sometimes the danger that we might give in to the heresy of dogmatism, of thinking that Jesus is a phantom Christ, like an avatar, with his feet always above the ground. And that is why we might think that he is so far away from us and we cannot really be like him. And we intend to be transformed into the Lord. If Paul can say in Galatians chapter 2 verse 20, it's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me, this same Jesus, who then is the Christ, the risen one, the anointed one, the chosen one of God, the Messiah, must then live in me. But I would like to believe that we need to encounter this Jesus in all his humanity. So we come to terms with the humanity of this Jesus in order that we might draw strength for our own humanity. The aim of the second week, which I would like you to keep in mind, even as we go through all the reflections of the second week, is a threefold aim. To know him more intimately, to love him more dearly, and to follow him more closely. It is not so much a linear process as it is a cyclic process. I know the Lord and my knowledge leads to love and my love leads to following and I still need to know the Lord so that I can love him and keep following him. So it moves on like a cycle. The word to know the Lord does not mean knowing the Lord in an intellectual sense alone. The mind is required, but during these days, more than the mind, we require the heart. So it is heart knowledge. It is with my heart, with my inner being, that I want to know who this Jesus is. And there is no doubt that this knowledge, this interior disposition which opens itself to the revelation that Jesus will make is knowledge which will lead to love. And this love will lead to following. So my knowing of the Lord 
will lead to my loving the Lord and my loving the Lord will lead to my following him. And in order to aid this knowledge, I want to take you briefly through three events which begin the life of Jesus. The birth of Jesus, the baptism of Jesus, and his temptations. This is, you might say, the beginning or the origin of the Lord coming down on this earth. In the spiritual exercises, when meditating on this birth of Jesus, the first of the three events that I mentioned, St. Ignatius proposes a meditation, which I'm going to change a lot, even as we reflect. And the meditation is this. The three divine persons are looking down on their beloved earth. And they notice that what was created to live in harmony, what was created as cosmos, is now disharmony, is now chaos. What was meant to be love is now fear. What was meant to be freedom is now being bound. What was meant to be used is now abused. What was meant to be shared is now being accumulated. What was meant to be given is now being taken. So generosity has been substituted and supplanted by selfishness and self-centeredness. And that is why this disparity is so great between the rich and the poor. The disparity is so great of all kinds. There is violence. There is avarice. There is licentiousness, there is rape, there is murder. In a word, there is total and complete selfishness. And the three divine persons, the father, we can imagine the father with long white hair and a long white beard. The son to his right, as we see in pictures of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit either as tongues of fire or as a dove. And the father runs his hands through his hair and asks, where did we go wrong? In Genesis chapter 18, verses 20 to 33, Genesis chapter 18, verses 20 to 33, we are given an insight into what I have just said. The Lord looks down and sees how great, the Lord says, is the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah and how grave their sin. I must go down, says God, and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. So God, Sodom and Gomorrah are only metaphors for the world. So the Lord is aware of the outcome. And Abraham, now Abraham, makes this play, makes this petition makes this constant invocation. And the Lord, even if there are 10, the Lord tells Abraham, even if there are 10, the Lord is going to forgive. So the Lord in the past 
has listened to the patriarchs. The Lord in the past has sent prophets. The Lord in the past has sent messengers. The Lord in the past has sent blessings and sometimes the Lord has sent challenges in order to bring back the people to what was meant originally. And the people have come back for a time and they have gone back again to their old ways. And so God rubs his hands through his hair and asks, where did we go wrong? What is it that we have not done for this people? We have sent prophets. We have sent kings. We have sent messengers. We have sent blessings. We have even tried to punish them occasionally only so that they would come back. And the father hears the son speak. And the son says, Father, we have not done everything. And the father is taken aback. What do you mean, my son? What remains to be done? And the son responds, Father, I have not yet gone down. And the father looks at the son, confused. You want to go down, my son? You want to go down to that filth and mire? You want to go down to that squalor and degradation? You want to go down to that sin and sinfulness? And the son says, yes, father. Okay, my son, go down like an avatar. The avatar has its feet above the ground. The avatar seems human to you and to me, but the avatar is not really human. Go down like an avatar, right the wrong, and that's why there are the Dasha avatar of Vishnu. So right the wrong and come up again to Swarga. And the son says, Father, if I must go down, I must think with their thoughts. I must feel with their feelings. I must experience with their experiences. I must be like them in every single way. Only then will we really know. And the father wants to block his ears. He wants to refuse to hear such blasphemy. My son. They will not listen to you. They will turn a deaf ear. They will pay no heed. They will continue to do whatever they want to do. My son, not only will they pay no heed, but they will look upon you as an obstacle and as a block and as a hurdle. And my son, they will spit upon you. My son, they will scourge you. My son, they will crucify you. And like God, when Abraham interceded in Genesis chapter 18, verses 20 to 33, was willing to let Sodom and Gomorrah free if they were 10. Here, the son says to the father, Father, even if one can be saved by my going down, even if one can be saved by my going down, it is worth it. And the father turns to the spirit. What do you say? And the spirit says, if he wants to go down, it's worth a try because we've not tried it. 
And the father runs his hand. At it. It's a conspiracy, two against one. Okay, my son, because the father has an ace up his sleeve. Okay, my son, you want to go down. You want to become a human in every single way. And the son says, yes, father, that is the only way. And the father says, find me one man in this entire universe who is capable of becoming a foster father. And so the search begins. Years pass, decades pass, millennia pass, not one can be found. One day, however, the son notices that there is someone. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. There is a man named Joseph who is betrothed to a woman named Mary. And this Joseph is sleeping. And the son looks at the father and says, Father, that is the man. And the father says, maybe. Why maybe? Because we cannot force him. We cannot coerce him. We cannot put pressure on him. We have to invite him. And even as Joseph is sleeping and is engaged to Mary but not living with her, he is told that Mary is pregnant. And he has to take her as his wife. When he gets up, he wonders, was I dreaming? Was it reality? But he interprets that as God's speaking with him. And he takes Mary as his wife. The child he knows is not his. But he knows that he must take Mary as his wife and the child is born. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. Wise men hear about the birth of this king of the Jews and they want to come and pay homage. They come and ask, obviously, the one who was ruling that place, Herod, the great and Herod the Great sends them to search because Herod is concerned about his own position and sends them to search for the child. And then they go. The child is born, Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 to 15. And now Joseph, the foster father, is sleeping with the mother Mary and the child. And in his sleep he has a dream. And in that dream, he's told that he must take the child and mother and rush to Egypt. Again, he believes that God speaks to him in a dream. And he moves to Egypt. In the meantime, Joseph has moved with the child and mother. And in the place where Joseph was, Matthew chapter 2, verses 16 to 18, because Herod realizes that the wise men have not come back and reported to him. And because he's scared of his position, he kills all the children, all the male children under two years of age by going by the date, the speculation of the date at which that child was born. So that that king of the Jews is done away with. Matthew chapter 2, verses 19 to 23. Joseph is now sleeping with the child and mother in Egypt. And in his sleep, he had a dream. And he's told in the dream to come back now to the land of Israel. He comes to Israel and is scared because now Herod's son, Archelaus, is now the Tetrarch. When Archelaus dies, then he comes to Nazareth. Matthew has structured his narrative here. Five parts, a chiasmus, Joseph's dream, Herod, Joseph's dream, Herod, Joseph's dream. 
every time Joseph slept in Matthew's gospel, he dreamt. And every time he dreamt, he was told to do something difficult by God. So Joseph said, best not to go to sleep. The point, however, is that there is a human. This is what we must rejoice about. That there is a human, a man, who is capable in God's eyes of being the foster father of Jesus. This is the joy. This is the privilege. This is cause for celebration. And God says to his son, okay, we found the man, now find the woman. That is much easier. In the same village, Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David. So there, that is the woman. Again, the father says, maybe we have to ask her. No coercion, no force, no pressure, only invitation. And Mary is invited. And the response of Mary goes beyond a simple yes, let it be done to me according to your word. I will be the passive receptacle who will become active because you are in me. The birth of Jesus asks us to reflect on three points which I would like you to take for your meditation in the first meditation on the birth of Jesus. And the first is this. It is a reflection on who God is. Our God in Jesus has made himself dust. Our God in Jesus has made himself Nothing, our God in Jesus has made himself vulnerable. When our God chose this way of coming into the world rather than any other way, and there were a variety of ways that the Lord could have chosen, a variety of ways. He could still continue to send messengers and prophets and kings. He could come down like an avatar. He could come down in the form of a miracle. There were many, many ways which God could have chosen. And yet, God chose this way. And through this way, God shows the vulnerability of God. The accessibility of God, the availability of God, the disponibility of God, that is shown. So in a way, the incarnation first reveals who God is and who is God. God is vulnerable. If I were to define how God is expressed in the incarnation, the word I would choose would be vulnerable. Other words are available. Other words are disponible. Other words are completely spent. <coughs> that is what God is. So the first reflection on the incarnation is about our God. Our God made visible in Jesus. There could be no more demeaning way, no more vulnerable way than choosing to come as a human being. The second, this 
vulnerability is not only in the coming of a human, but it is when God places God's existence on the yes of human beings. If God had to be human, if God had to choose this way of the incarnation, God could never, never choose the way unless Mary and Joseph said yes. And Mary and Joseph are representatives of humanity. So we notice even God's choice of this way, that is the incarnation is dependent on me. You can notice the disponibility. So it is not merely that God has made himself vulnerable. That is, you can see that by becoming a human. But even more than vulnerable, God has placed God at my mercy. If Mary said no, if Joseph said no, there be no incarnation. There would be no incarnation. Jesus could never have been born. He could never have become human. So we see that the incarnation is a way in which God wanted to demean God. In which God is so demeaning that there could be no further putting God down. You could not put God further down. That is the meaning. So the first is God's own vulnerability. The second is God placing God at the mercy of humans. At the mercy of humans' affirmative response. And waiting for that response. Depending on that response. So when we want answers quickly, this is what we need to keep in mind. When we think we are shortchanged, this is what we need to keep in mind, that God makes God vulnerable and at our mercy. And the third is this. That when we look at the human Jesus, not at the risen Christ, when we look at the human Jesus, we are inspired as to the kind of human being he is. His proclamation, his parables, his miracles, his way of life, his ministry, his mission, all of these as a human being inspire us to realize that there is no limit to what a human being can do. So the incarnation interpreted is limitlessness. That even in our vulnerability, even in our humanity, even in our so-called limitedness, because of Jesus, we are limitless. So now, our hymn is not a plaintive. I'm only human. Not only human, you're a human. If God has chosen this way of coming into our world, he has graced our humanity. So now you cannot give your humanity as an excuse. You cannot give your humanity as a limitation. You cannot use your humanity to say, I am only human. No, I am human. I glory in my humanity. My humanity is an Advantage. It is not a limitation. I'm not a bird. I'm not a plant. I'm not an animal. I'm not a tree. I'm not a fruit. I'm not the sea. I'm not a fish. That is okay to say. 
but it is not okay to say I'm only human. You notice when you say I'm only human, you're already setting a limit. I'm only human, so what can you expect of me? But Jesus was human. And that is why I said at the beginning, I want to focus on Jesus. Because there is a danger, but he was son of God. No, he was not son of God. He was Jesus when he was on this earth. And so my brothers, in this first reflection on the birth of Jesus, I would like you to take these three points for your reflection. And even as you read the scripture texts, which I suggested, I would pray that this will come across to you, namely, the total disponibility, to use an Ignatian term, which is going beyond even availability. Disponibility is a term which goes beyond availability. So this total disponibility of God, it is, you might say, what Paul talks about, the kenosis, the self-emptying. Philippians chapter 2, which we will read at our Eucharist this afternoon. So, kenosis, this vulnerability of God. The second, this kenosis, this, this vulnerability is taken even further when God allows God to be at our mercy. Mary and Joseph are representatives of the whole of humanity. And one reason why we cannot find the presence of God as we ought to find the presence of God is because unlike Mary and Joseph, the historical Mary and Joseph, we keep saying no. God is inviting and wanting to become incarnated again and we keep saying no, so we cannot find God's presence. However, we don't lose hope. The third point which I offered for your reflection is this. That my humanity is never now a disadvantage. I do not see the limits in my humanity. I see the limitlessness. The synoptic gospels, Matthew and Luke, have the infancy narrative. And Luke has an incident in the youth of Jesus when he was 12 years old. However, in the case of the three synoptics, the first foundational experience in the life of Jesus was his baptism. The adult Jesus is baptized. Many think that he was possibly about 30 years old and Luke even mentions this when he was baptized. Now, even though there is a slight difference in the narration of the baptism, there is a lot of agreement. The baptism is narrated by the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 9 to 11. Matthew, chapter 3, verses 13 to 17. You notice... Matthew takes six verses to narrate the baptism. Five verses, I mean. Matthew takes five verses to narrate the baptism. Matthew 3, 13 to 17. And Luke takes only two. Luke chapter 3, verses 21 and 22. So the baptism of Jesus is an incident narrated by all the three synoptics. If you go through the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 9 to 11, this is what you will read there. And Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. So Mark is unambiguous. Mark is very, very clear. He tells us who came, from where Jesus came, and he also tells us who baptized Jesus. Now Matthew, very clearly, wants to show that Jesus is superior to John. 
John is only a messenger. He's only a precursor. He's only the one who goes before. So Matthew's gospel, the reason why Matthew takes five verses is because Jesus comes to John. But the moment Jesus comes to John in Matthew, John the Baptist gets nervous. And he tells Jesus, but you coming to me, I was the one should be baptized by you. How is that you are coming to me? And Jesus tells him, let it be so for now. So in other words, Jesus gives John permission. It is after Jesus gives John permission that John baptizes Jesus, not before. So Matthew very clearly shows Jesus was baptized by John, yes, but only because Jesus gave him permission. And John already acknowledged his inferior status when compared with Jesus, when he said, I should be baptized by you and yet you come to me. That's why Matthew takes five verses. Luke goes even beyond everyone else. In chapter 3, verse 20 of Luke, we are told that Herod committed many sins and one of the sins he committed was he shut John in prison in chapter 3, verse 20. Jesus is baptized in chapter 3, verses 21 and 22. If John is in prison in chapter 3, verse 20, and Jesus is baptized in chapter 3, 21, 22, who baptized Jesus in Luke? We don't know. We don't know. So Luke will say, when the people had been baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized, he does not tell us by whom. What is the point? The point is this we can see that Matthew and Luke would rather not write about the baptism. They are loath to write about the baptism. They are backward to write because it shows Jesus in a sort of inferior light. First, it shows Jesus as if Jesus is a sinner because very clearly in Mark's gospel, John the baptizer preaches a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So if Jesus is being baptized, it indicates that he also is a sinner. And Mark has no problem with this. Because Mark shows his total humanity. And so Mark will simply say, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Matthew has a problem. Matthew has a problem because John's proclamation, even if Matthew will not add the phrase forgiveness of sins, John the Baptist does not have permission in Matthew to forgive sins. In Mark he has, in Luke he has, but not in Matthew. John the Baptist preaches a baptism of repentance. That's all. No forgiveness of sins in Matthew. So you notice what the evangelists are trying to do. They are trying to show that Jesus is superior and yet all three mention this incident. Why? Because first, it was historical, which doesn't mean that the other incidents are not historical. More importantly, it means it was the foundational experience of Jesus. It was that event. It with Jesus got his enlightenment, his cardonaire, if you like to call it. His illumination, his clear, clear goal and mission got at the baptism. All the three evangelists are agreed about the three events that occur. Even if Matthew's voice points to Jesus out through the pronoun, this is my beloved son. We will not talk about that. I want to focus on Mark. And so my suggestion to you would be to read the baptism scene as it is narrated by Mark chapter 1, verses 9 to 11. This is what we read there, Mark chapter 1, verses 9 to 11. Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee, and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As he was coming up out of the water, 
as he, Jesus, was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens rent open. The heavens were torn open. And the Holy Spirit come down as a dove. That's the Spirit. The Spirit come down as a dove. So the rending open of the heavens according to Mark is the plea of Isaiah 64 1. Isaiah pleads with God to rend open the heavens, to tear open the heavens and come down one last time to save humanity. So Mark possibly alludes to Isaiah 64 1 when he says Isaiah's prayer is being answered. The heavens are rent open and the spirit comes on Jesus. So Jesus is experiencing this. He sees the heavens rent open, the Holy, the Spirit come down as a dove, and he hears a voice. The voice in Matthew will point to Jesus by saying, this is my beloved son, not the voice in Mark. In Mark, the voice issues an invitation. And the invitation is through two Old Testament texts. This is what the voice says. You are my beloved son. In you, I am well pleased. You are my beloved son. Is from Psalm 2 verse 7. In you, I am well pleased or... In you, my soul delights, is from Isaiah 42 1. Psalm 2 is a coronation psalm. It was a psalm which was sung when the king was ascending the throne in order to be anointed by the priest who was waiting near the throne for the king. So it is a coronation psalm. It has to do with kingship. It has to do with glory. It has to do with honor. It has to do with authority. It has to do with the crown of gold. You are my beloved son. The Greek is agapetos. You are my agapetos. Isaiah 42 is the first of the suffering servant songs. Behold my servant whom I uphold my chosen one in whom my soul delights, or another translation, in whom I am well pleased. It has to do with servanthood. It has to do with service. It has to do with slaveship. It has to do with the crown, but with the crown of thorns. So the invitation <clears throat> might seem like a double invitation and slave is doulos. The invitation might seem like an invitation to be agapetos, you are my beloved son, and doulos, in you my soul delights. However, the invitation is to be son or king. However, the invitation is also to be servant and slave. The invitation is to be king, servant, is to be servant, king, is to be king who becomes king by being servant, is to be king who becomes king only, only by being servant. This means there is no other way. One direction, one road, one way to be king who becomes king only by being servant, to be son, who becomes son only by being slave. 
This is the invitation. Anytime you and I have been striving for positions in the society, and surely our striving is because we want to do the best, because we know our talents, we know our abilities, and we want to do the best, whether it is for the community, whether it is for the province, whether it is for the ministry, whether it is for the work, but we are striving for positions. And Ignatius was so, so wise when he saw that in case anyone is striving, they're on the wrong track. They don't belong with us. There is nothing that we can strive for when we see that our Lord was invited to this. Our Lord decides then. And so that is why every single synoptic gospel, I mean all three of them, have immediately after this baptism scene, they have the temptations. So this invitation, because as I said, God never forces, God never coerces, God always invites. And this invitation now is issued to the Lord to be king servant, to be servant king, to be king who becomes king only by being servant. This is why Jesus goes to his Eremos. He goes to his desert. He goes to a lonely place. He goes to an uninhabited place like you are in now. And so this is a very, very good time, my brothers, to reflect on your own vocation. It is likely that most of us may have been baptized as children and we may not remember the baptism. However, what we do remember is the, temp the call which was made to us when we joined the society. And, and even if, even if we don't really recall that call because it was many years ago, we can recall our call now. And we can link up the baptism of Jesus to my situation now. And the Lord who has called me many years ago is once again recalling me to be king servant, yes. But to be king and son who become king and son by being servant and slave. That is the invitation which we must keep in mind. So any striving, any lobbying, any political maneuvering is not in keeping with wanting to be servant king. And that is why we also need to go through the temptations. Mark chapter 1 verses 12 and 13. Mark, unlike Matthew and Luke, does not have the three temptations. He simply says this, that the spirit drove, drove Jesus, uses a very, very strong verb, ekbalo. The spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness, drove him. That means he was compelled. Now he has received this invitation. He has got to discern. He has got to make a reflection. He has got to make, decide now whether he is capable, wants to, does not want to. So now is a time for discernment. Whose side is he on? Which kingdom is he going to choose? Mark chapter 1, verses 12 to 13. Jesus, the spirit drove Jesus. So in other words, when Mark tells us that the spirit drove Jesus, it was sort of both an external compulsion and also an internal compulsion. The spirit is leading him into the wilderness. Remain alone. Matthew and Luke have the three temptations, though the order in Luke is slightly different from the order in Matthew. In Matthew, it is stones into bread. 
the pinnacle of the temple and the kingdoms of the world. In Luke, it is stone into bread, not stones, the plural, but the singular stone into bread. The kingdom of the world and the pinnacle of the temple is last because for Luke, the temple is an important theological topos. More important than the mountain is the temple. It begins in the temple, his gospel, it continues in the temple, and it also ends in the temple. That's why Luke's temptation third, the climax, is the temple. So now, in a summary form, what are these temptations saying? Whether it is stones into bread, or whether it is stone into bread, this is the point. To serve the selfish interest. This is a point of reflection for us. How often have my comforts and even my luxuries been more important than the ministry? So the temptation of stones into bed or stone into bed, look after yourself. You need to look after yourself. And while that is true, I might look after only myself and nobody else. That is also the danger. So surely we need to look up to ourselves. Surely we need to take care of ourselves. Surely we need to do what is required for our health. All those things are true. But it is also true that we look up to ourselves to such an extent that there is no time for us to bother about anyone else. And Jesus says, no, there are more things than simply looking up to yourself. The second temptation, which, and I've taken Luke because I believe that Luke has changed the order when the world is shown to him. Everything you can see here. There is a phrase that we use. We are in the world, but not of the world. I wonder. I wonder whether that is really true of us. The larger majority of us, even after we have made our commitment to the Lord in religious life and in the society, might still be very, very much of the world. How is it that we can inspire others if we are like them? The word ecclesia, is from Ekkaleo and translated in English as church. Ekkaleo means ek is out. Kaleo is called. So ecclesia is from Ekkaleo, those who are called out. These are called out. They are set apart to be a contrast community. The first letter of Peter, chapter 2, verses 4 to 10, gives a beautiful definition of church. You are the ecclesia, GC 35, decree 2, number 10. I think this is such a beautiful statement that it can summarize the entire retreat. GC 35, decree 2, number 10, says, those who encounter us must ask about us this question, which is, who are you that you do these things and that you do them in this way? So it is my identity. Who are you that you do these things, that is my ministry. And you do them in this way, my way of proceeding. And so, in this look in second temptation, where we are asked, and Luke shows us that Jesus is asked to give to the world what belongs to God alone. To be those in the world who will inspire people to change. So they identify us as contrasting. 
as people who are different. And we look, my brothers, unfortunately, in our world, there are almost no Jesuits who we can count as these contrasts. Or if there are, we can count them on our fingertips. Out of the 20,000 that we have on our fingertips, we can count those who are meant to be that contrast. So where are we today? We are so much part of the world. Our values are so much ingrained in the values of the world that we are giving to the world what belongs to God. And this is the temptation. When we are shown the kingdom of the world, they lure us. We become comfortable. So the larger majority of us, unfortunately, are living lives as comfortable bachelors. And today, married life is so, so, so challenging. And we have chosen the easy way out. The bachelorhood, brahmachari. It's easy. I don't have responsibility for wife. I don't have responsibility for children. I don't have responsibility for their education now and for their school fees now and for providing for their future and for nothing. I come when I want. I go when I want. I do what I want. So we have become so much part of the world that people hardly recognize us. Except when we say that we are Jesuits, except when we use the term before our name, father, so and so, then they get up. But otherwise, no. And that is the temptation which Jesus had. And he says, no, what belongs to God, belongs to God. Let us give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. But that is only small things belong to Caesar. The human person belongs to God. And in the third temptation, and for the only time, the devil quotes scripture because he finds that Jesus has quoted Deuteronomy to him and has retorted, has responded well. So now the devil thinks he can trap Jesus by quoting scripture. So in the third temptation in Luke, the pinnacle of the temple, he quotes scripture, Psalm 91. <clears throat> and this third temptation is a temptation which many of us give in too often, asking God for a sign. In these days, we need to teach people how not to ask for a sign and what to do instead. But if we are the very ones asking for a sign and we are confused with what is happening and we can make no sense of it, then how are we going to educate people not to ask for a sign? To inform them that every sign we ever needed is being given to us already. Jesus responds and will not put God to the test, will not ask God for a sign. But we need to ask ourselves if we can do that. And so my brothers, as we reflect on the threefold aim of the second week, to know him more intimately, to love him more dearly, and to follow him more closely, I pray that the birth of Jesus, in which we saw the total disponibility of God, the vulnerability of God made even deeper by placing God at the mercy of humans' response and our own limitlessness because of Jesus. The invitation that we have heard occasionally in our vocation as Jesuits to be king servant, but to be servant king and to be king or to be son who becomes king and son 
only by being slave. We might have stopped hearing this invitation. We need to rehear it. And we need to ask ourselves what we are going to do about the temptations that keep coming in our way. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.